This message is relevant for me, for my wife, Faye, for my children, my grandchildren, for all of you. We are all builders, according to Paul. We are all building something. And yes, the church is a building, and we use that uh, figuratively, the church is the building of God. All of you are parts of that. Jesus is the cornerstone, but you're stones in the building. Also, we're a building in and of ourselves, individually. The body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So it's relevant, and if you don't build with the right materials, the building can collapse and not serve its purpose. I want to read you, first of all, the um, passage and then share one of the most traumatic moments of uh, our married life with what happened to a building. If you have the Word of God, you can turn to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And uh, I, I was sharing back there, I mean, it's not the greatest fact in the world, but since we're diabetics at Sam's Club, they have a uh, yogurt called Oikos. O-I-K-O-S. It's really good for us. Um, Protein it has, but no sugar, no fats, none of that. And it tastes good. I don't know if they put drugs in it or what, but it tastes good. And it's called oikos. Well, oikos is in this passage. Oikos, evangelism. Fuller Seminary came out with a lot of church growth materials, and oikos is household evangelism. When the Philippian jailer was stunned by the earthquake and asked Paul, what should we do? And he gets saved, and it says, and his whole household got saved. Oikos. So he's going to talk about building here, and each of us is building something, something that will be judged one day. All right, uh, I'll begin reading in verse 10. By the grace God has given me, this is Paul speaking, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. That's part of the message today, build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day, the day of judgment, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. Now, this next verse is tricky, but this is the word of God. And so it has credibility because it came from the Spirit through Paul to us. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved. Now, that's not our goal, to be saved and try to serve God throughout life, and we just don't see any fruit, and we see more failure. This verse is very important. God's not going to steal our salvation away, but our works will be judged. Hear it again. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become, quote, fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. And some of the things we've heard people say and promote in the last couple years of the United States of America do sound foolish. 
And yet people embrace them, and they support them, and they endorse them, and they give money to them. Well, that doesn't mean they're wise. It doesn't mean they're true or authentic. It can be foolish. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are of Christ and Christ is of God. Father, we're building, I'm building, they're building, the good brothers and sisters before me. And I pray today that this message will help them build stronger, more vigorously, and build with materials that can be tested by fire. And that will put away the wood, hay, and stubble of our lives. Thank you that you are so gracious to even forgive us and save us and take us to heaven when we have chosen unwisely about our building materials. But Lord, we, we want to build something solid. We want to leave a legacy. We want our children, our grandchildren, our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers, our fellow mates at school to observe a building which is strong, durable, and resilient. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and all God's people say, amen. The scriptures today that were sung, Justina and the worship team, will go to my opening illustration. Blessed be the name. In the good times, praise his name. In the bad times, do the same. And Justina quoted from Psalm 34, and it's very meaningful to Faye and I because we were young in our first church, and um, she had to go into surgery in Pittsburgh. She had the chief of surgeons working on her, and they didn't know if she had breast cancer or not. And so I thought, well, what can I take? She loves yellow roses. Uh, I know that. If I give any of you yellow roses, you women, I'm in love with you. So um, I thought also the Lord wanted me to take Scripture. And I memorized and shared at my wife's bedside, Psalm 34, 1 through 8. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant. So shall your faces never be ashamed. This poor man cried, David said, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Then the guardian angel verse. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy is the man that takes refuge in him. Then we sang, Great is thy faithfulness. That song came from the book of Lamentations. A lament is a very sad song. And Jeremiah is lamenting what is going to happen to God's people. It's going to happen. It's going to be devastating. It's going to be disastrous. But in the midst of the lamentation, chapter 3 and verse 23, the verses that you all, because you sing them so many times, many of you know them, great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father, There is no shadow of turning with thee. That was during a lament. So when we build in life, trying to build a family, perhaps a business, perhaps a ministry, sometimes things go wrong. And Paul will emphasize here, if we build with the right materials, in the end, what we tried to build, even though tested by fire, will survive. So, this is a little longer than you want it to be, but I'm going to read it anyway. This is a story that really happened to us 
in our first church. It made the front page of the Washington paper in Pennsylvania. Uh, it made a magazine, and it is a true story. Our first church um, voted the last pastor out 11-11. You had to have one more than majority. It was 11-11. That's the church we went into. And the Sunday school average attendance was 23. The worship attendance was 33. And uh, the total giving for a year was $9,500. Faye and I have given more than that to the Lord's work in one year, ourselves. When I was working full-time in a multiple staff church. That was the year of giving. And the DS said, well, I was leading a choir in my home church. I know that's hard to believe, Justine and Stan. Please don't laugh, but you are starting to laugh. And he said, uh, Arnie, I have a church I want you to go to. The parsonage is like a dollhouse. It was so bad when we got there. They wrote an article about Faye and I buying all the things from Western Auto to fix it up. And we had our picture uh, what kind of suit did you have on? I had like a leisure suit on, and the women, it was a slack suit. And we get our picture in the paper. That's what, it was a doghouse, not a dollhouse. But you know what? God blessed it. And within two years, we had a rally day of 300. Two years. That wasn't what we were averaging, but I told them I would grow a beard if they got 300. And they pulled the last four people, Eric, off the street and brought them in. And I had to grow my first beard. Um, Faye does not like a beard. Um, I only wear it when I'm upset with her. So there's the background of building because this church collapsed. The winter of 78 was considered the worst in western Pennsylvania history. The Monday of January 23rd was temporarily considered the worst in Bentleyville Wesleyan's church history. A winter storm. Had, any of you remember the storm of 78? That went, yeah, you can look around. I mean, this was a mammoth storm. A winter storm had invaded the area over the weekend, so I decided to drive my wife, Faye, a visiting nurse, to see her patients. Overcoming some adversities, we completed the schedule and went back to the health center in Manesson, Pennsylvania, to allow Faye to do her charts. Joe Montana came from this area, those of you who know football. I was sitting in the lobby reading Barclay's commentary on the Revelation when I overheard Faye being paged to the phone. The fire chief, shaken and stumbling over his words, quickly questioned, where is Reverend Flegel? Faye summoned me to the phone, and I asked what was wrong. Your church has collapsed. My mind raced to the thought, well, maybe it was the old one. But he countered my next question with the solemn verdict, your new church has collapsed. Since my other car was at the church, they had surmised that I was underneath the rubble. Two ambulances, a fire truck, police, and several cars had converged on the scene, Responding to the CB radio announcement that I was under a mountain of wood, glass, celotex, and shingles. We left immediately for the site. It seemed at first like a fantasy, so incredible, so unreal. This was our first pastorate, and I thought, this is going to be our last. This was our first pastorate. The Lord had blessed us with success, and Bentleyville was the fastest growing church in the district. On the way home, we prayed for the gift to appear strong in front of those who would await our arrival and gauge our reactions. I had so zealously proclaimed to our congregation, winners never quit and quitters never win. And our coaches here have probably used that. I even taped that slogan on my desk to aid in my resiliency. I was soon to be at center stage with my people, and that slogan and its proclaimer would be tested. As for the slogan, I was to find it and my desk sheared and covered for that piece of furniture had recently been moved to the church we were building. As the car negotiated the final bend, we took our first glimpse 
it looked like a giant garbage dump and would have served well for a before and after commercial in the reverse. It was difficult to get a closer look, but after some shuffling of cars, we were able to park ours and see the damage firsthand. We stood with the ladies who found it easy to express grief. But when those strong men walked alongside the fallen building, they had sacrificed to erect. Their tear glands exploded. That was a moment which will be etched on our memory files for a lifetime. By the way, they hauled 14 dump truck loads of debris from that new church. It seated 400 and something. Just flat. I'll get to the point. We determined as a community of faith to trust in the character of God, that he was using the collapse, and that's what we were singing about today, difficult times, dark times, that he would use the collapse for good, though we didn't know what good. We have since discovered his plan and rejoiced that he loved us enough to allow the collapse. That evening brought a call from the county's largest paper, and the next day we made the front page. The reporter's contact was unexpected, and when she asked if this was the end of the project, the Lord gave me the reply, we see this not as a period, but a comma. She seemed quite impressed with that statement, justifiably so, for God does insert commas in your life and mine, although we sometimes jump to the conclusion that they're periods. If somehow that principle of comma rather than period could be applied to marriage difficulties, job disappointments, educational roadblocks, whatever seems to collapse our plans, we believe to be in God's will. So many more would see their dream the whole way through. At Bentleyville, we learned to pray the Gethsemane prayer. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The cup tasted bitter to our lips, but through time turned to honey in our hearts. Disaster has a unique way of unifying people. In our affliction, God used a multitude of instruments to propel our comeback. The news echoed of the $38,000 damage on our new church. Many ministers called or wrote. One of our Wesleyan churches brought a dozen men for a work day. The district made an unprecedented gift of $3,500 to our plight, and the denomination pitched in with an extra loan. Some fine Christian relatives and friends chipped in with encouraging words and additional monetary contributions. The Lord was teaching both me and the people that when a collapse seems to empty our bin of resources, then God, with his infinite resources, opens heaven's silos. In our weaknesses, God's strengths are marvelously manifested. The verse he gave me for the new desk came from Isaiah 41.10. I think I gave it to you, Pat, and Pam. That was one of the verses I gave to you. Uh, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. For I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. Our congregation is now growing and glowing better than at any time in the church's history. Quote, fame attracts people, unquote. And the Lord gave us a basket full of advertising we could never have afforded. (laughs) Our small church enjoyed instant notoriety, and this has served to enhance its ministry. Robert Addington, my district superintendent, told me, Brother Flegel, you have had 15 years of training in three short years. God gave me a cram course in living. I now enjoy an envious position. Numerous pastors across this nation, in their visitations, meet with the excuse, if I came to church, the roof would fall in. And I have the answer. Don't worry, brother. It already has. Let me give you two more things. The insurance agent, because the snow was so great, those of you who remember, I can see her, attractive woman in this blue snowsuit, coming up to our trailer because we were going to build a new parsonage too, which we did. Uh, came to the door, came in, and told us there is no snow insurance in the state of Pennsylvania. That's pretty heavy. 
And then the insurance adjuster, he was a big, overweight, roly-poly type of guy. We're walking up. I can't remember if we were walking up from the debris or walking down. He said, Reverend, maybe you're praying to the wrong God. I wanted to push that sucker down that... Anyhow, I didn't. But can you imagine somebody saying that to somebody? I mean, there it was on the ground. Now, you say, well, Pastor, that's a poignant emotional story. It is for Faye and I and for those people. And by the way, I told the newspaper, you put it on the front page when it collapses, I want you to put the rebuild on the front page. They didn't, page three. You know why it came down? Because two reasons, building materials. That's what this message is about. We used, and you men are going to say, Pastor Arnie, you didn't. I mean, this is a big church, seated 400 some people. We used one by threes to save money instead of two by fours. I, I know, I know, Sharon, even you're, you're, I know you're saying, and Faye's more mechanical than I am. Okay, but it wasn't just me, it was guys that could build. And they had scissor trusses, if you can imagine like the X, a lot of you know what they are. The big staples they used had failed. So they were culpable and we were culpable. We ended up losing $7,000, which is almost what we took in in a whole year when we got there. And uh, they had to put the building back up, at least to the level it was. And we finished it and we had a dedication, but we used faulty materials and they use faulty materials and the same thing goes for our marriages our raising of children our churches if you use the good materials what you build can endure the storm if you don't it's coming all down all right now, you're saying, Pastor Flegel, you've used 12 to 14 minutes of your sermon. I know I have, but it's worth it. What we use. So if you're using good materials, it makes a difference. All right, let's look at the passage. And then I have, a, I think, a beautiful poem at, at the end. So he's talking about building a disciple. And that's one of our thrusts here at Cross. Point. We're trying to build disciples, build men and women who are warriors, not wimps, in the kingdom of God. And he continued this theme that we are God's building. And, and there's that word oikos. The word for building stretches it out a little bit. Oikodome. He said, we're, we're building something. And um, Paul acknowledges that God's grace... Remember, he was capturing Christians, and those Christians were dying, and he held the garments of that godly Stephen who was stoned to death. I mean, that was Saul then before he became Paul. But he said God's grace had enabled him to be an expert builder. Only one foundation, he said, can be laid, and that is the foundation of Jesus Christ. For my life and yours, the foundation must be built on Jesus Christ and his word. Somebody say amen. And people that build on other foundations, you know, California psychics, (laughs) Ouija boards, all kinds of things we consult and sometimes pay a lot of money to, you better build on Jesus Christ. Your marriage will survive. Your children will turn out much better. Your legacy will be preserved because of Jesus. What are we building with? And so he says that this gold, silver, gold, silver, and precious stones would be used in the composition of a temple. So when you built this church, I bet you use good materials. It seems really strong. And, uh, but some people build with wood, hay, and straw. It's cheap. It's quick. 
But cheap and quick does not always work when the storms come. Amen? You remember? The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock, and the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down, and the floods came up. The rains came down, and the floods came up. The rains came down, and the floods came up. And the house on the rock stood firm. The foolish man built his house on the sand. The rains came down, the floods came up. The rains came down, the floods came up. The rains came down, and the floods came up. And then when you were a kid, and the house on the sand went boom. I don't know if you remember that. We learned that in happy hour. That's what they called our children's gathering. And we went on our honeymoon, and there was a new hotel in Myrtle Beach called uh, the Otsman, and it said... uh, uh, Happy hour was at 4.30. I said, Faye, we have that at our church. Um, It's a wonder Faye stayed with me. Some of you are laughing. Don't touch the Lord's anointed. Um, So the issue around what you're building, what I'm building, and I haven't always built right, but when we're sane spiritually, we build with materials that have durability, all right? And the Word of God and the Holy Spirit have durability. I went over to my neighbors yesterday, and this is free. We're not going to take another offering, but this wasn't in the message. So Maori didn't miss it. But his mother came over a week ago and said, uh, uh, Arnie... um, our mower ran through your yard. You know how wet everything was? We had one of those big mowers. And uh, he was coming down their hill, and he slid and couldn't stop it. <laughs> I really try to take care of my grass. <laughs> but anyhow, it was a little bit on our land, more on their land, though people probably think it's our land because we have this wonderful space of grass between the two houses. We're not tight. And uh, so I went over yesterday because my neighbor, Tom, uh, brought over. He said, I saw you had this hole in your yard, a a couple holes. And uh, so he brought over uh, some dirt, and uh, we filled it up, and I put grass seed on it, and I think it'll be fine. But I went over to talk to him. I didn't want him to feel bad, Tammy, that we had done this. He said, well, I'll pay you for it. I said, no, no, no. Um, Tom will pay me for it. No. Uh, But he said, did you hear about my son? Now, this comes to building materials. This actually happened yesterday. He said, you hear about my son? I said, no. He said, my son was in an accident, and his car flipped over seven times, and he was put on life support. And he showed me the pictures. Keith, they're just absolutely, it reminds me of my mother when she was dying and what she looked like with all these tubes and, you know, what do you call that, Faye, in the throat? Yeah, trach. And he said, when we went to the hospital and we went in to see my son and some of his friends were there, I met his one friend, Donnie, who's a roofer the other day. And they went in, the doctor said, well, he, he's not coming out of it, and we're going to have to drill his skull. Now, I'm not sure my neighbor, John, is a believer. But he said, we join hands, and this one woman prayed that God would touch his son. And if he didn't come right out of his bed like that, this half of his body raised up. And everybody's like shocked shocked and this roofer named Don said you know what that is Trudy he said do you know what that is that's the Holy Spirit of God wow what a testimony to a guy whose son's going to be in the hospital for two months he did come out of it amazing if you see the pictures and uh, but the Holy Spirit One of you women could have been the one that prayed. 
one of we men could give it to God, put it in his hands. And boy, what a witness for a father seeing his son who may not survive come up and live. You see, what, um, the materials we choose to work with. Remember, we chose one by threes, not two by fours. I know some of you men are going to talk about this at lunch. You're not going to let me build your house. Okay, which, uh, th- thanks, Rick. I really appreciate that. You're an elder and you did that. Ryan, take care of him after service. So, durability. What is the point to me, to my wife, to my sons, to my grandchildren, to all of you? As believers, our work may be burned up if we build with cheap materials. We may see the collapse of what we're building. However, and this verse is important, the salvation of those who build with the wrong materials, their salvation is sustained, which points to how wonderful is the grace of God. Think about that. We choose wrongly, unwisely. Remember in the one Indiana movie, the wise man says, choose wisely. And the guy picks up the wrong drinking vehicle. And he comes apart. So, we're building a disciple, build with solid materials. Number two, we are God's temple. You are, and I am. Paul is emphatic that believers, and I'll be emphatic here, understand that they are the material of God's temple. Now we're talking about the collective church. Because we use a plural here for a singular building. You and I are part of his building. Think of that. Who we were before we were saved. And he's put us into his building. Aren't we honored? Amen. Think about it. And naos, I don't know why I put that in there. It's the Greek uh, for a shrine or sanctuary. Then, referring to us as plural, and the word for temple is singular... He says that people who try to destroy the temple of God, and by the way, the church is under attack right now. If you haven't heard, Grand Canyon Christian University in the state of Colorado, they are threatening to shut it down. It's one of the most gracious, giving colleges. I even mentioned about our oldest grandchild going there, Grand Canyon University. We are under attack. Know that. We are under attack. You are under attack. Satan goes about like a roaring, seeking whom he may devour. It's kind of intimidating. But he says God's temple is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The collective church is and we are. And uh, people who try to destroy the temple will regret it. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, he speaks about uh, each believer believing himself to be a temple. The body's the temple. Some of you weren't here last week. I probably should have saved the illustration to this week, but I'm going to tell it again because it's one of my favorites. The body is the temple. My body is the temple. Your body is the temple. And uh, I shared last week that our youngest son tried to pull one on his mother because I'm up at the pulpit so he knows his dad can't grab a hold of him. But Faye was a charge nurse, is still like a charge nurse. And it's amazing how the children and the grandchildren listen to her. You women have a certain look that just seeps right through you. And you know you're in trouble. You're in trouble. So this happened to Mark, but I'll use Bob Harrington. And he got in the back and his mother knew he was acting up. I told it last week, but listen to it again. And she gave him the eye. All of you know what that is, right? You know what the eye is. And he didn't. What's she going to do about it? She's up there. His friends think it's really funny. He's making fun of his mother. Ugh. 
Well, he did it again and again, and finally she got up and went back and grabbed him and started to lead him out of the church. And you know what he screamed out? The bodies, the temple, the bodies, the temple, the bodies. That's pretty smart, isn't it? I would have been like, I would have liked to have been there to see him get it. And my mother, she used, by the way, my dad only beat me once that I, with a belt. I had talked back to my mother. And my dad was a street brawler. He was a general superintendent who made a lot of money, but he was out wine, women, and song. Strong. And he only whipped me once. That's all I needed. But mother would use those uh, toys that become weapons. They're a paddle. They have the elastic string and then the ball. But once the elastic string breaks, it turns into a weapon, Terry. So mother, I I don't know how many times, more than 100, I'm sure. The oldest child gets the most beatings. The second child gets a little bit less. And the third child gets to beat the first and second children. I, I, I know what bloodshed in the woodshed is. And then I learned, because I never put anything in there. Some of you did. So when you got hit, it cushioned the blow. I would scream before the paddle got there to kind of slow it up a little bit. I don't know if any of you used that tactic. If you, if you yell early enough, your mother's like, I don't want to kill him, you know. And then my mother had the nerve to tell me one time, Arnie, this hurts you not as much as it hurts me. It hurts me more than it hurts you. And I thought, Mother, spank yourself. Anyhow, here he is talking about the bodies of the temple. And um, we are to honor God with our temple. So what we do to this body, and someone made a great comment. It's not mine, but I've used it. It was written, we are not responsible for the body we are born with, but we are responsible for the body we die with. In other words, some of us, the genes have come through, and the gene pool wasn't correct, and we have certain afflictions. You know, diabetes in Faye's family is just rampant. They've lost an eye. They've lost a kidney. I mean, you know, but we are responsible for the body we die with. So the body, you do the best you can with what you got. All of us have liabilities. We live in a fallen world. But Paul says the body, our bodies, are the temples that hold the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Kind of changes the way we, we, we look at that banana split, doesn't it? But in Hebrews we heard there's pleasures in sin for a season. Builders that are wise and foolish. Let me finish up. Paul points out that we can deceive ourselves. Do you believe that people are deceiving themselves by what materials they are using to build their life, their marriage, their child raising? I mean, some of the things about what we are teaching children in the home right now about themselves going against their own identity, their biological identity, that's what's being taught to these kids. You think that's good building material? No. So we live in a culture where many times the building materials are fallacious and feeble and doomed to fail. Doomed to fail. And so he says you can either evaluate yourself by the wisdom of God or by the wisdom of the world. Be careful. Be careful. He challenges us to become a fool. Quote, fool. And the Greek word is moron. We've seen that before in his writings. And um, I told you that I was saved on April Fool's Day, April 1st, 1962. And I've, I've often said, I became a fool for Christ's sake. I became a fool for Christ's sake. And he views man's wisdom in an inverted fashion. Man's wisdom right now, what we're hearing through radio, television, the internet, books, it is crazy. 50 years ago, those people would have never thought we would be where we are today in our culture. Do you, do you remember growing up in high school, what it was like compared to now? I walked through Stowe High School 
when I was pastoring in Stowe, I could not believe what I saw in the lockers, the dress. And I'll tell you what, we need to be brave enough to help our people live the Christ life. The largest church in our district is Grace Middleburg Heights. I work with them when I was in the district office. Their pastor got up one morning and said to the ladies of the church, I'd like your attention. You are to dress in moderation, and some of you are dressing in such a manner that you will tempt the men in this church. Because men are turned on by sight, and women are turned on by touch. He actually said that in a worship service. Be careful how you dress. That's not the slacks dress argument. It's do you dress in a way that honors God? You can look beautiful and still not be erotic. Are you with me? If you want to do this experiment, walk through a public high school for three minutes and take a couple notes what people are wearing. It's the wisdom of the world. Oh, this is the way the culture is right now. We're to change the culture. Not the culture change us. This is important stuff. We are building. We are building a legacy. We are building families. We are building churches. And we must use good materials. Because wood, hay, and straw burns up when the fire comes. Gold, silver, and precious stones don't. Let me get to the end. He said, don't boast about men. Boast about God. Wise, prudent advice. And he said, because of our relationship with God, um, not the wisdom of men, all things are ours because we have the Lord. We have everything we need. He said, we are Christ's possession. Peter will say that in 1 Peter 2, 5 through 9. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, God's own nation. You are God's possession. Isn't that so? I mean, think about that, Matt. We are the possession. We are the family of God. We were orphans, and he adopted us and brought us into the family. All of you who were saved were orphans. That's the word in Ephesians 1, 5. It's orphan. But we've been adopted. Praise the Lord. Because we have him, we have everything we need. Let's build with good materials. Summary, we are the people of God who build and are being built in partnership with him. I found this uh, poem, and I want to share it. It's called A Builder or a Wrecker. And you see both in culture, you see both in your neighborhood, you see both in your schools and at your workplace. But we don't know who wrote it, but I like it. As I watched them tear a building down, a gang of men in a busy town, with a ho-heave-ho and a lusty yell, they swung a beam and the side wall fell. I asked the foreman, are these men skilled? And the men you'd hire if you wanted to build? He gave a laugh and said, no, indeed, just common labor's all I need. I can easily wreck in a day or two what builders have taken years to do. And I thought to myself as I went my way, which of these roles have I tried to play? Am I a builder who works with care, measuring life by rule and square? Am I shaping my work to a well-made plan, patiently doing the best I can? Or am I a wrecker who walks to town, content with the labor of tearing down? Oh, Lord, let my life and my labors be that which will build for eternity. That's who I want to be. Amen. Father, as we prepare to close this worship, help us not to close the book on this truth that the building materials of our life need to be of high quality need to be able to pass through the fire, 
need to be able to stand the test of time and the opposition of the world. I pray that we may build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And if there are those here today who do not know for sure that they are saved or who desire to be saved, Lord, through the Holy Spirit, speak to them and show them if they will confess their sins and accept your marvelous, indescribable gift of salvation, they will be saved. Lord, thank you for all in this room who are believers. Help us to build so that our building does not collapse. And I ask it because it's your will for your church and your people. In the name of Jesus, the cornerstone. In his name we pray and all God's people say, amen.